Billy Joel, known as the Piano Man, suffered a devastating blow when he was swindled out of a staggering $90 million by his brother-in-law. Despite his best efforts to build his career, Billy Joel ultimately left his fans heartbroken when they discovered his difficult life at the age of 74 behind the camera lens, especially after the loss of his fortune. If you still don't know about the trials that Billy Joel had to go through, this is definitely the video for you. Prepare yourself mentally to get started. In the heartbreaking saga of Billy Joel's family history, we delve into the tragic tale of his Jewish grandfather, Carl Joel, whose life of prosperity took a grievous turn amid the tumultuous era of Nazi Germany. According to Fred Schruers in Billy Joel's official biography, the Joels once enjoyed affluence through Carl's thriving mail-order linen company in Nuremberg during the 1920s. As the global economy plummeted, the Nazi party emerged, offering seemingly desperate citizens answers to their economic woes. Tragically, Jews like Carl Joel became convenient scapegoats in this unsettling period. The German populace, swayed by Nazi propaganda, began ostracizing Jewish businesses, deeming Jews as inferior citizens. The harsh reality manifested in Billy Joel's father, Helmut, who, as a young Jewish child, was subjected to the painful segregation of sitting separately from other students at school. By the mid-1930s, the Nazis escalated their persecution of Jews, and even the successful Karl Joel found himself in their crosshairs. Initially accused of underpaying and sexually harassing his workers, Karl attempted to counter these false allegations by relocating his factory to Berlin. Desperation forced him to agree to new Nazi terms, including hanging a sign proclaiming his business as Jewish-owned. However, in 1938, a cruel twist of fate unfolded with the passage of a law forbidding Jews from owning businesses. Forced to sell his thriving company to the Nazis at a fraction of its actual worth, Karl's misfortune deepened. The Nazis' seemingly magnanimous offer of payment concealed a sinister plot. It was a ruse to lure him into arrest. Fleeing persecution, the Joels sought refuge in Cuba in 1939, using what little wealth they had left to expedite their escape. Their arduous journey eventually led them to New York City in 1942. The echoes of this harrowing history resonate in Billy Joel's present-day actions as he continues to honor his Jewish heritage. In a poignant protest against the resurgence of hate, he wore a Star of David during a 2017 Madison Square Garden show in response to the neo-Nazi march in Charlottesville, Virginia. A symbolic gesture that reflects not just the enduring pain of his family's past, but also a fervent commitment to standing against bigotry and injustice. Drafted into the United States Army in 1943, just a year after narrowly escaping the clutches of the Nazis with his parents, Helmut, now adopting the more Americanized name Howard, returned from the war profoundly changed. In the aftermath of the conflict, Howard embarked on a new chapter, marrying Rosalind Nyman. Their union bore witness to the birth of a son on May 9, 1949, whom they named William Martin Joel, a name that would echo through the annals of musical history. However, the joy of parenthood was overshadowed by Howard's frequent and prolonged absences due to work-related travels. A specter in his own son's life, Howard cast a shadow described by Billy as a dark presence. The disconcerting ambiance at home was exacerbated by Howard's disillusioned outlook on life, exemplified by a chilling statement he imparted to a young Billy, Life is a cesspool. The strains in their relationship intensified, leading to his parents' eventual divorce during Billy's formative years. Howard, seeking solace or perhaps escape, returned to Europe, where he went on to raise a new family, a decision that left a profound mark on the budding musician. The absence of his father cast young Billy adrift in a quest for identity, a journey marked by both liberating possibilities and a lack of a stable center. Howard's departure, however, carried an unintended silver lining. 
Despite being a classical pianist himself, Billy believes that had his father stayed, he might have discouraged him from pursuing a career in professional music. The tumultuous father-son relationship took a turn later in life when Billy Joel reconnected with Howard. In an interview with Howard Stern, Billy disclosed that his poignant composition, Vienna, served as a cathartic vessel for processing the complex emotions tied to his father. The song, a lyrical exploration of the passage of time and the need for patience, became a poignant expression of Billy's inner journey. In 2012, following Howard's death, Billy dedicated Vienna to his father during a heartfelt performance a bittersweet reconciliation in the twilight of their complicated bond. Billy Joel's journey into the realm of music was a poignant escape from the challenges he faced in his early years, as vividly recounted in Fred Schreuer's account of his life. The genesis of his musical odyssey can be traced back to the family piano, where his constant tinkering prompted his mother to make a sacrifice they could ill afford, paying for piano lessons. What began as a chore soon blossomed into Billy's profound passion. As a young boy, he may not have been a social butterfly, but wherever a piano beckoned, he would gravitate toward it, enchanting those who bore witness to his budding talent. However, the musical path he chose was fraught with societal expectations, particularly during the early 1960s, when music was not deemed a masculine pursuit. In an era where boys were expected to engage in sports and project toughness, Billy's affinity for the piano set him apart. To exacerbate matters, his piano teacher also instructed ballet, a fact that made him an easy target for taunts and ridicule. The streets echoed with jeers, and other kids, oblivious to his musical prowess, mocked him with queries about his non-existent tutu. Bullies added physical torment to the verbal assaults, knocking his piano books from his hands and subjecting him to physical abuse. Faced with this adversity, Billy made a bold decision. He took up boxing, a sport traditionally associated with toughness and masculinity. In the gritty world of the amateur boxing circuit, Billy Joel found an unexpected refuge. Winning 22 out of his 26 matches, he became a force to be reckoned with. When street bullies confronted him, he fearlessly faced the biggest adversaries, emerging victorious and earning the respect that silenced his tormentors. Boxing became a crucible that shaped not only his physical endurance, but also his resilience in the face of adversity. However, Billy's boxing career came to an abrupt halt in his 26th match, marked by a pivotal moment, a broken nose that would become his signature appearance. Undeterred, he channeled this experience into his art. The cover of his 1977 album The Stranger featured a pair of boxing gloves, a symbolic tribute to the sport that had shaped him. Reflecting on his journey, Billy articulated a profound truth. I know what it feels like to get hit, but I also know what it takes to get back up. The tragic chapter in Billy Joel's life unfolds with a tumultuous sequence of events chronicled by Fred Schreuer's in Billy Joel. Following an affair that entangled his best friend and bandmate, John Small, Joel found himself entangled in a web of loss and despair that would leave an indelible mark on his psyche. The affair cost Joel not only his friend, but also his band, his paramour, and even his home. At the tender age of 21, he was forced to retreat to the refuge of his mother's house, a poignant admission of what he perceived as utter failure. The weight of his mistakes and the wreckage of his relationships pressed upon him with unbearable force. In the depths of this emotional maelstrom, Joel, grappling with guilt, despair, and hopelessness, reached a devastating breaking point. A fateful night in 1970 saw him making a desperate call to John Small, a plea for reconciliation and understanding. Small rushed to Joel's side, only to discover him lying on the floor of his mother's home in a state of profound distress. The gravity of the situation prompted an urgent trip to the hospital, where it was revealed that Joel's stomach had been pumped, a haunting sign of a life teetering on the edge.
The unsuccessful attempt at self-harm marked a grim moment in Joel's struggle with inner demons. His self-perceived failure cast a shadow that intensified the storm of emotions within him. A few weeks later, Joel, still haunted by feelings of guilt and despair, embarked on a second, thankfully unsuccessful, attempt. Recognizing the gravity of his mental health, he took a courageous step and checked himself into a psychiatric hospital for a harrowing three-week stint. It was during this period of profound darkness that Joel penned the haunting lyrics to Tomorrow Is Today, a song that, according to many friends, doubled as a chilling farewell, a possible suicide note. Reflecting on the song years later, Joel acknowledged the deep depression that fueled its creation, juxtaposed with the wisdom gained from the vantage point of time. Now, from this perspective, I can say, what did he know he's 21? In 1985, a glimmer of resilience emerged as Joel channeled his painful experiences into a powerful anthem of hope. The release of Your Only Human, Second Wind, marked a symbolic turn in his journey. With all proceeds dedicated to a teen suicide prevention program, the song carried a message of empathy and understanding. Joel, drawing from his own harrowing past, sang, You probably don't want to hear advice from someone else, but I wouldn't be telling you if I hadn't been there myself. In the quest to establish himself as an artist, Joel partnered with Artie Rip, the owner of Family Productions Records a figure willing to take a gamble on the aspiring musician. Together, they embarked on the journey to create Joel's inaugural album as a solo artist. The result was Cold Spring Harbor, released in 1971, a project that held the promise of launching Joel's musical career. However, the optimism surrounding the album was soon shattered by a grievous error in the mixing process. At a listening party with friends, Joel confronted the devastating truth. Everything, including his vocals, had been inexplicably sped up. The haunting consequence left his voice eerily reminiscent of Alvin and the Chipmunks, a humiliation that cut deep. The profound embarrassment Joel felt was palpable as he recalled the experience, expressing a desire to escape, wishing to crawl inside his piano and close the lid on the public shame he had endured. To compound the tragedy, Rip, the man who had taken a chance on Joel, had run out of funds and was unable to rectify the catastrophic mistake. The dream of a successful debut album had morphed into a nightmare of distorted vocals and shattered aspirations. Frustration and anger welled up within Joel, prompting him to seek a separation from Rip. However, the harsh reality revealed that he was bound by a contractual obligation to family productions. Trapped in a professional arrangement that had soured, Joel found himself reluctantly tethered to Cold Spring Harbor, forced to tour with an album that bore the scars of a botched mixing process. Billy Joel's escape to Los Angeles in 1972, as chronicled by Fred Schroers in Billy Joel, unfolds as a tragic yet transformative chapter in the artist's life. Faced with the entanglements of a troubled record deal, Joel sought refuge on the opposite coast, where the glimmering lights of Los Angeles held the promise of a fresh start. In a twist of fate that mirrored the bittersweet irony of his musical journey, Joel adopted the stage name Bill Martin and took up a position as an entertainer at the executive room on Wilshire Boulevard. The Piano Bar, a stage for his alter ego, became the canvas upon which Joel painted a make-believe reality, shielding himself from the harshness of the industry that had bruised his spirit. For six months, night after night, Joel, under the guise of Bill Martin, poured his soul into the keys, playing until the early morning hours. It was a time of paradoxical solace, financially sustaining, with free-flowing drinks that offered temporary reprieve from the tumult that defeated his life. Yet, beneath the facade of this alternate identity, the poignant reality remained. Joel was a man grappling with the disillusionment of unmet expectations and the desire for artistic freedom. 
Out of the crucible of his experiences at the executive room emerged Piano Man, a song that would not only become his most famous, but also a deeply autobiographical ballad. The limerick-laced waltz painted a vivid portrait of the characters inhabiting Joel's alternate reality, the patrons of the piano bar, each bearing the weight of their own struggles. In a surprisingly uplifting refrain, the song captured the essence of the human spirit's resilience. As the character sought solace in the simple act of listening to music, a collective endeavor to forget about life for a while. The poignant lyrics told the stories of those who, despite their failed dreams, found solace in the shared experience of camaraderie. In the melancholic beauty of Piano Man, listeners encountered a powerful message, that even in the face of adversity, the human connection, however fleeting, could serve as a salve for wounds inflicted by life's disappointments. As Joel sang of characters sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. The tragedy of unfulfilled dreams gave way to a poignant affirmation of the human spirit's capacity to find solace and connection in the face of life's hardships. Billy Joel's love for motorcycles took a tragic turn on April 15, 1982, as recounted by Fred Schruers in Billy Joel. In possession of hundreds of vintage and custom bikes stored in his Oyster Bay garage, Joel's passion for the open road collided with a fateful incident that would leave an indelible mark on his life. On that ill-fated day, Joel was navigating his motorcycle down New York Avenue, blissfully unaware of the calamity that awaited. Jim Boyer, Joel's sound engineer, trailed behind, unwittingly becoming a witness to the unfolding tragedy. A car careened into the front of Joel's motorcycle, sending shockwaves through the air. The violent impact jerked the wheel sideways, trapping Joel's hand between the handlebar and the gas tank before violently hurling him from the bike. The musician, once in command of the open road, now lay sprawled on the unforgiving asphalt several feet away from his mangled motorcycle. Emergency services swiftly intervened, transporting Joel by ambulance to a local hospital. His injuries were severe and required urgent attention. Subsequently, he was airlifted to Manhattan's Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, his hands in casts, a poignant testament to the toll exacted by the accident. The extent of the damage became tragically clear. Joel's hands, essential tools for a musician, were in a dire state. Beyond a dislocated wrist, his left thumb had suffered pulverizing trauma. Reconstructive surgery was attempted, but the outcome was far from a complete restoration. The musician, known for his finesse on the piano, had lost the distal phalanx, the bone at the tip of his left thumb. Despite the profound impact on his ability to play, the accident did not spell the end of Billy Joel's musical career. However, the aftermath left its mark on his playing style. The subtlety and nuance that once characterized his performances were replaced by a raw, unfiltered quality. Joel himself acknowledged the transformation, stating, Because of the damage to my hand, there's no subtlety in my playing, no real nuance at all. For rock and roll, I can hold my own. But in classical or jazz terms, I stink. Billy Joel's foray into managing his own career took a tragic turn, as detailed by Fred Schruers in Billy Joel. In 1975, wearied by the complexities of business dealings, Joel appointed his wife, Elizabeth Joel, as his manager. Initially, this move seemed like a strategic decision to navigate the intricate landscape of the music industry. For years, Elizabeth played a pivotal role in transforming Joel's career into a resounding success. However, the strain of professional collaboration began to seep into their marriage. In a bid to salvage their relationship, Joel made a difficult decision. He terminated Elizabeth from her managerial role and, instead, entrusted the responsibilities to her brother, Frank Weber. Describied as a trusted friend and father figure, 
Weber Asamta Managiri Al Reigns in an effort to reconceal the personal and professional facets of Joel's life. The rupture in Joel's personal life deepened following a life-altering event, the motorcycle accident in 1982. Elizabeth, accompanied by an attorney, approached Joel in his hospital room with a contract that proved to be the catalyst for a devastating breakdown. Feeling betrayed, Joel confronted his wife about the callousness of presenting a legal document while he lay in a hospital bed. The emotional toll proved insurmountable, leading Joel to file for divorce. The divorce proceedings were acrimonious, with Elizabeth making formidable demands, including claims to royalties and real estate. The legal battle reached new heights when Elizabeth even sued her own brother during the tumultuous divorce. The final settlement, as Joel described it, was a pretty hefty divorce agreement, leaving lasting financial implications. To this day, Elizabeth continues to receive royalties from Joel's early albums. The tragedy, however, didn't end with the divorce. In a shocking turn of events, a 1989 audit revealed a staggering financial betrayal. Weber, the once-trusted brother-in-law and manager, had embezzled millions of dollars from Joel over the years. The extent of his deceit included fraud, faulty investments made in Joel's name, and numerous unauthorized loans. The fallout was immense. Joel severed ties with Weber, filing a lawsuit seeking $90 million in restitution. However, the legal proceedings only yielded a fraction of the losses— with Joel recovering a mere eight million. The financial scandal, described by Joel's lawyer as one of the worst he had seen, cast a long shadow over the artist's life. The profound betrayal by those closest to him punctuated Joel's journey with the harsh realities of trust shattered and the devastating consequences of greed. Billy Joel's relationship with alcohol, while not uncommon in the world of rock stars, unfolds tragically as a recurring theme in his life, as detailed by Fred Schruers in Billy Joel. In contrast to the tumultuous stories of excessive drug use that often accompany rock and roll narratives, Joel's tale is one of reliance on the numbing embrace of alcohol, a companion that has stood by him through the highs and lows of his journey. In Joel's own words, no matter what, alcohol was always there for me. The singer-songwriter candidly admitted that while he might not be well-versed in the nuances of sobriety, he is intimately acquainted with the complexities of drinking. The familiarity with alcohol as a form of self-medication is a poignant revelation, underscoring the depth of his struggles with substance use. The turning point arrived in 2002 when Joel, after a prolonged bout of heavy drinking lasting three months, checked himself into rehab. However, the stint proved to be brief. With Joel only staying for a few days, his casual dismissal of the experience, likening it to a musician seeking routine dental care, hinted at a nonchalant attitude toward the gravity of his struggle. Even his friend and touring partner, Elton John, expressed concerns attributing canceled shows to Joel's alcoholism and advocating for more serious rehabilitation. The gravity of Joel's battle with alcohol became starkly apparent in 2005, marked by a series of car accidents that raised alarm bells for his then-wife, Katie Lee. Faced with growing concerns, Joel made a more committed effort to address his issues, checking himself into the Betty Ford Center. This time, the stay lasted a month, providing him with a dedicated period to focus on his recovery. In hindsight, Joel acknowledged the significance of this decision, deeming it one of the best things I ever did. Billy Joel's journey through love and loss, as chronicled by Fred Schruers in Billy Joel, is a poignant tale woven with the threads of passion, heartbreak, and the relentless pursuit of connection. The echoes of his romantic tribulations resonate through the melodies of his music, each song a lyrical testament to the tumultuous relationships that have shaped his life. In his early years, Elizabeth Weber, his first wife, became both muse and subject for Joel's compositions. The song Summer Highland Falls 
stands as a lyrical canvas painted with the hues of their tumultuous relationship, capturing the essence of a love teetering on the edge of both sadness and euphoria. The lyrics echoed the dichotomy of their emotional landscape, encapsulating the highs and lows that defined their union. Brief romantic interludes with model L. McPherson brought their own set of doubts and apprehensions. Joel, with a keen awareness that the relationship was fleeting, penned, and so it goes, infusing dissonant notes and poignant lyrics like, and you can have this heart to break. The song encapsulated the inevitability of a love destined for an end, a melancholic reflection on the transience of romantic entanglements. However, it was Joel's relationship with supermodel Christy Brinkley that catapulted him into the limelight of public fascination. Their love story, beginning in 1983 and culminating in marriage in 1985, seemed like a fairy tale. The album, An Innocent Man, became a musical tribute to Christie, immortalizing their love in notes and lyrics. The iconic Uptown Girl music video starred Brinkley, and she also lent her artistic touch to the cover art for River of Dreams. Yet, like all tales, theirs bore the strains of reality. The marriage, marred by heavy touring and Brinkley's desire to relocate, fizzled in 1994. The subsequent marriage to aspiring culinary star Katie Lee marked another chapter in Joel's romantic journey, but it too ended in divorce in 2009. The equestrian Alexis Roderick entered his life, and they married in 2015. In the midst of these romantic ups and downs, Joel's poignant reflection on the significance of love shines through. You can have all the money in the world. Without the girl, it doesn't mean a god and thing. Despite the tumult, Joel remains friends with all his ex-wives, a testament to the enduring respect and connection that lingers in the aftermath of love's complex tapestry. Billy Joel's creative hiatus, as unveiled by Fred Schruer's in Billy Joel, is a tragic interlude in the illustrious career of a musical icon. The echoes of his silence marked by the absence of new albums since 1993's River of Dreams, reverberate through the intricacies of his personal and artistic struggles. One facet of this creative pause is interwoven with the threads of romance and heartbreak. Christy Brinkley, often jokingly referred to as Joel's Muse, presided over an era of prolific songwriting. However, with their divorce, a creative well seemed to run dry. Brinkley playfully teased that Joel hadn't written a new song since their separation, a commentary that hinted at the complex intersection of love and artistic expression. Yet Joel's reasons for this creative hiatus extend beyond matters of the heart. The confines of pop music, which had once provided a comfortable framework for his lyrical expressions, became a stifling box. I wanted to write something other than the three-minute pop tune, he explained, likening the experience to being confined in a metaphorical coffin. The desire for artistic evolution clashed with the constraints of a genre that had defined his earlier successes. Alcohol, a companion, that had accompanied Joel through tumultuous times, played a significant role in this creative downturn. Drinking was one of the reasons I stopped writing songs, he revealed. The numbing effect of alcohol once a source of solace, became an impediment to the creative process. The pain of not meeting his own artistic standards, exacerbated by the influence of alcohol, created a formidable barrier. Joel confessed to Howard Stern, The worst thing about songwriting is the struggle. I love having written. I hate writing. The album River of Dreams, released shortly before Joel's divorce from Brinkley, became a focal point for media scrutiny as journalists dissected the lyrics for insights into his personal life. Uncomfortable with this invasion, Joel grappled with the decision to expose his innermost struggles through his art. I said, wait a minute, I don't want to rip myself open and let everyone see everything, he revealed. The vulnerability embedded in his lyrics became a source of discomfort, further contributing to the decision to step away from the creative spotlight. 
Even at the zenith of his career, Billy found himself entangled in a web of criticism and disdain, a dissonant counterpoint to the adoration lavished upon him by legions of fans. Critics, wielding sharp pens and harsh words, carved out a niche of contempt for Joel's work. Robert Christgau, a prominent voice in music criticism, deemed him a force of nature and bad taste, a damning indictment that cast a long shadow over Joel's artistic endeavors. Leo Leibovitz further fueled the fire, unleashing a barrage of disdain that labeled Joel's music as singularly awful and branded it with the damning adjectives of solipsistic and soulless schlock. Ron Rosenbaum went a step further, dedicating an entire piece titled The Worst Pop Singer Ever to berate Joel, solidifying his place in the crosshairs of criticism. A common refrain in the cacophony of disparagement was the accusation of being derivative. Joel, however, defiantly acknowledged this allegation during his induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999. In a moment fraught with both self-awareness and rebellion, he admitted, Well, I'm damn guilty. I'm derivative as hell. He astutely pointed out that if such grounds for elimination were strictly applied, many present at the induction ceremony would be disqualified. The weight of criticism once manifested in tangible acts of frustration. In the earlier chapters of his career, Joel, stung by the vitriol, was known to rip up bad reviews defiantly on stage, a symbolic act of rebellion against the relentless barrage of negativity. Yet, as time wore on, a transformative shift occurred. The scars of criticism, once keenly felt, faded into insignificance. In the words of Fred Schruer's in Billy Joel, the artist reached a point where he no longer cared about the slings and arrows of detractors. What do you think of Billy Joel's life after experiencing many tragedies, especially after losing all of his fortune? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.